In our modern era, just about everyone has access to a camera at any given time. As most of us carry smartphones and we're able to capture precious memories at a moment's notice. But every now and then, scary and creepy photos are unintentionally taken when disturbing images show up in the background. When a photographer decided to take a few photos of a burning house, they managed to capture something creepy in the background that many people believe to be the former inhabitants of the building. Details on the incident are scarce, but it's believed that the building in question had been standing empty for quite some time and that it was razed to the ground by the local fire department in a controlled demolition. In the photo, traffic cones can be seen in the foreground, indicating that they were placed there as a preventative measure to keep innocent bystanders from getting too close to the inferno. But it is what was captured next to the house that caught the attention of the photographer. In the first two of the photographs, nothing seems to be out of the ordinary, save for the burning house. But in the second image, in the smoke that can be seen billowing out of the building, silhouetted against the backdrop of trees in the background, is what looks like a woman carrying a child away from the fire. The woman looks like she has long brown hair and is wearing a blue and gray outfit. She's carrying the child in her arms and they seem to be looking in the same direction, facing right to the photographer. At the time that the photo was taken, the building and surrounding area had obviously been cleared by the fire department and so it's impossible that there were two living people right next to the house. It was only later when inspecting the photos that the photographer realized they'd caught the strange image as no one was aware of the creepy apparitions at the time. Some people have speculated that they are the ghosts of a mother and child that lived in the building sometime in the past, while others theorize that there is in fact nothing there and that the smoke and the background foliage merely created the illusion of two specters escaping from the house. A scary photo was taken in Malaysia following a bus crash and it's made all the more creepy when it was inspected a little more closely. The crash happened on a small bridge, causing the bus to careen over the side and come to a rest on its roof, reportedly ending the lives of three people. A photographer who was at the scene decided to take a few photos of the aftermath as the bus was being removed from the water and unbeknownst to them, they managed to capture something creepy and unsettling in the background. Underneath the bridge, just to the side of one of the rescue workers, there appears to be an unknown creature peering out from the darkness with a sinister expression on its face. Some people have speculated that this is merely an illusion caused by the overhanging shrubbery or by a trick of the light, but others aren't so sure. Many local people believe that demons are often responsible for tragic events such as car crashes, collapsed buildings, or even natural disasters, and that they can sometimes be seen in the area of an incident after the fact, as if admiring their handiwork. None of the rescue workers or onlookers reported seeing the sinister figure at the time and it was only when the photographer was studying their photos that they noticed the strange image in the background. The King's Arms Hotel is one of the oldest pubs in Britain, located right next to the Hampton Court Palace in the southwest of London. It's said that in the 19th century, a mother and her young son both lost their lives in the building and that they still haunt the pub today. There have also been reports that people have seen a gray-haired woman looking out from one of the upstairs bedroom windows on occasion, despite the room being completely empty at the time. Despite the rumors of hauntings in the buildings, it's still a popular watering hole and on Christmas Day of 2014, school teacher Debbie Monteforte and her husband Alex were visiting the pub along with their son Raphael. They were seated at one of the tables enjoying their drinks when Debbie decided to take a photo of Alex and Raphael as a keepsake. A family friend would later state that Debbie had taken the picture and thought nothing more of it until she looked at it on her computer at home and she spotted something creepy behind Alex. 
what appears to be an elderly woman wearing a black coat can be seen at the right edge of the photo, and both Debbie and Alex are adamant that there was no one fitting that description in the pub at the time that the photo was taken, and that there was no coat hanger in the pub. Added to that is the fact that the woman seems to be at least 8 feet tall, and would certainly have been noticed if seen by the patrons in the bar. But not everyone is convinced that Debbie managed to capture a ghost on camera. Russ Hodgson, founder of SPI Paranormal Investigations in Surrey, decided to run the image through investigative software, and he believes that it's not an apparition. He stated that the figure just doesn't look like the ghosts caught in typical photographs of that kind. He added that the figure seems to be solid and blocking out a section of a nearby candle, as opposed to the translucent images of ghosts that people are used to seeing. When he inspected the image after running it through the software, he noticed that what looks like an elderly woman's face seemed to more closely resemble a cat. He says that the person seems to be looking downwards, with hair sticking out just beneath the back of the cap, where the back of the head would be, and that the outline of the collar on the coat is just too sharply defined to be an apparition. His conclusion was that there was indeed someone standing behind, or passing by Alex as the photo was taken, but the family merely failed to notice them. He didn't, however, give any explanation as to why the figure seemed to be so impossibly tall. Many people are firm believers. However, given the history of the area and the Hampton Court Palace in particular, it's believed that two of King Henry VIII's wives still haunt the palace, the first being his third wife, Jane Seymour, who passed away during childbirth in 1537. She is reportedly often seen in October on the anniversary of her son's death, carrying a candle in an area called the Silver Stick Stairs which once led up to the room where she lived and ultimately passed away. The second, more famous ghost is that of his fifth wife, Catherine Howard, who he had executed in 1542 after learning that she had committed treason and had been unfaithful to him. It's claimed that after her arrest, she managed to break free from the guards and ran along an area now known as the Haunted Gallery, screaming for mercy from her husband. She was caught once more by the guards and led away before she could reach the king, and it's said that to this day, she repeats the incident from time to time, running through the palace, shrieking for her life to be spared. One October on a sunny day in the town of Tamworth in Staffordshire, England, 38-year-old Richard Jones was visiting the Tamworth Castle grounds with his family. His daughter was playing on the grass outside the castle when he decided to take a photo of her as she stood near a gaggle of geese. But when he later looked back at the photo, he realized that he had caught something creepy in the background. Some distance away, just inside the tree line that borders the lawn, he spotted what seems to be two figures that he didn't notice at the time that he took the photo. At first, he was confused and couldn't quite make out what he was seeing, but states that he believes that they are two knights one of which is carrying a shield. He added that it would make sense since they were so close to the castle. He says that he was completely baffled as the figures didn't seem to have any color, appearing to be completely white. But this isn't the first time that someone has spotted a ghostly figure at the castle, as it has a long known haunted history. The building has stood at that location since the Anglo-Saxon times, when it was built by the daughter of King Alfred the Great as a stronghold against invading Vikings. Over the years, visitors have reported hearing tables and chairs being dragged across the floor, only to find that nothing had moved. Others have reported seeing a strange blue mist near the display of the 19th century ceramics, and in a room called the Ladies' Chamber, a legendary spirit known as the Black Lady has been seen. It's rumored that the spirit of a 19th century nun called Editha, who was first seen in a bedroom where she attacked a man with her staff. Some people have stated that they believe the photo, taken by Richard, shows two knights that are still doing their duty, guarding the palace where they served centuries ago. In 2008, a graphic designer named Neil Sandbach 
was making preparations for a wedding that was to be held at the Tewinbury Farm in Hertfordshire, England. And he had decided to take some photos of the old buildings as decorations for the guest invitations. When he was done taking the photos, he went home and uploaded the photos to his computer. He started looking through them to find a suitable image for the wedding stationery, and was shocked when he noticed something creepy in one of the images. Next to an old barn, there appears to be the spirit of a young boy dressed in white clothing, peering around the side of the building as if he wanted to be included in the photo. He later stated that he wasn't aware of any children being in the area at the time, but he didn't believe it to be a live person anyhow, as it seems oddly out of focus as if it's glowing slightly. He decided to let the soon-to-be-married couple know about the strange apparition, and they were amazed by the image. Just before the wedding was to take place, they decided to do a little investigating of their own and asked the farm owners and staff before telling them what they had found. When asked if the farm had any history of strange occurrences, they were told that there was a small boy dressed in old-fashioned white bedclothes that had been seen on many occasions lingering in the area where the barn stands, confirming the sighting that Neil had caught on camera. When asked if there was any information on who the boy might be, they stated that there was none that they were aware of and that there wasn't any tragic history connected to the barn or the farm as a whole, adding further mystery to the mysteriously creepy photo. The Sally House, located at 508 North 2nd Street in Atchison, Kansas, is rumored to not only be the most haunted house in Kansas, but in the entire United States. It was built in the mid-19th century when Atchison was still a growing community, and since then, it has garnered a reputation from the horror stories that occur there. The house has gained its nickname thanks to a young girl named Sally who was brought to the house while suffering from severe appendicitis. The owner of the house, Dr. Charles Finney, performed emergency surgery, but Sally passed away during the operation. She is said to still haunt the house's halls today, with many people describing seeing her in the cellar and one of the upstairs rooms, which is filled with toys. In that same room, people have described seeing some of the toys move on their own and hearing phantom footsteps. Sean Daly, an anthropology professor, has done some research on the house and although he says that there is no proof that a girl named Sally ever lived there, he agrees that there is definitely something strange going on in the building. He states that they've had objects move on their own, window blinds open and close when no one is nearby, and some people have reported being scratched by an unseen spirit. The current owners of the house keep the radio on at night to keep Sally happy. But it's not just Sally that haunts the house. Some visitors have seen the figure of a middle-aged woman in some of the rooms, and she is rumored to be behind some of the more sinister activity that has been recorded there. One person claims that they stayed over when a friend lived there and one night while they were asleep, the curtains in the friend's room inexplicably caught fire. It's believed that those who suffer scratches and bruises are victims of the woman's attacks. Other strange activity that has been reported includes mysterious cold spots, physical touches, malfunctioning electronic equipment, and training guide dogs that refuse to enter the house, even when prompted by their owners. West 10th Street in Greenwich Village, New York is the location of a haunted house known as the House of Death. The house was built in 1856 and has seen its fair share of inhabitants over the years. The widow of James Borman Johnson, the founder of the Metropolitan Underground Railroad and the Broadway Underground Railroad, moved into the house after he passed away and it's said that the strange activity started as soon as she and her children left the property. The famous author, Mark Twain, also lived in the house for about a year while he was battling bankruptcy. Many people have reported seeing him trudging up and down the stairs, 
and some believe that he is also the one responsible for the disembodied sounds of marching that can sometimes be heard coming from many of the vacated sections of the house. Shortly after the house was transformed into a co-op building with 10 condo apartments, one woman and her daughter reported seeing him sitting, perched on one of the window seats. Twain, whose real name was Samuel Clemens, approached them and said, My name is Clemens, and I has a problem here I gotta settle. In the next morning, he seemed to vanish into thin air. After actress, author, and psychic Jan Bartel moved into the house on one of the top floor apartments in 1957, she reported almost immediately that there was a monstrous moving shadow that followed her around the house. On another occasion, she wrote that she saw the ghostly figure of a man standing in the hallway. She reached out to try to touch him and described the sensation as a chilly, damp substance without substance. Her family also claimed that food which they had not purchased and that was already rotting would appear at their dinner table as if it had been sitting there for days or weeks. When they hired a paranormal expert to investigate, they were told that the house was haunted by upwards of 22 spirits. This included a woman in a white dress, a young girl, and a gray cat that still walks through the house. 9820 Easton Drive in Benedict Canyon, Los Angeles is better known as the Jean Harlow House. Since the famous actress lived there in 1932, after her husband, Paul Byrne, who was an MGM executive, bought it as a wedding gift for her. Byrne would be found deceased in the house on the 5th of September of that same year. His passing is suspicious since many people claim that his common-law wife, Dorothy Millay, took his life and made it look as though he took his own life. Millay was known to suffer from mental health issues and had spent time in a Connecticut sanatorium. In 1963, celebrity hairstylist Jay Sabring bought the house and soon after started dating actress Sharon Tate. She often stayed over at the house and stated that on one of those nights she was sleeping in Byrne's old room. She woke up to the sight of Byrne standing in the middle of the room and she fled. As she reached the stairs, she saw another ghostly figure tied to the staircase, though she couldn't tell whether it was a man or a woman. When another family, who is known only as the H family, bought the house, Mrs. H went there the day before they were to move in. As she walked up the stairs, her dog started growling and barking at something in the upstairs rooms, and she approached the master bedroom and felt a strange presence before someone whispered in her ear, please help me. On the first night in the house, while the couple was getting ready to sleep, a heavy object struck the side of their bed three times, but there was nothing to be seen. They also reported that the ceiling lights would flicker on and off, and that a strange formless light would appear near the ceiling in the living room. In that same room, Mrs. H and her aunt heard the painful sobs of a woman, and on many occasions there would be knocks on the front door, but when it was opened, no one was there. In the kitchen and the upstairs bedrooms, people have reported feeling cold spots, and in the children's bedroom, there have been reports of a smell of a woman's perfume. On one occasion, Mr. and Mrs. H had the same foreboding dream in which they saw the bathtub full of water and bubbles. They both saw a hand reaching out from under the water, switching on the light, and receiving a shock before withering back under the water. They phoned an electrician to investigate the switch in the bathroom, and he found that the wiring was dangerously outdated and immediately replaced it. The S.K. Pierce House is a haunted house that was built by a wealthy furniture company owner, Sylvester Pierce. The S.K. Pierce and Sons Furniture Company was so successful that it led to Gardiner, Massachusetts being known as the Chair City. The house took over 18 months to build, and many of the features such as the moldings were all hand carved. But the mansion soon saw some hard times as the family's fortune started to dwindle. Pierce decided to turn it into a boarding house, and soon it was the site of unsavory activity such as gambling and excessive drinking. 
a Finnish immigrant named Eno Sari, is said to have succumbed to a fire in the master bedroom in 1963. And many people believe that the fire was caused by spontaneous human combustion. Since then, people have experienced an array of paranormal activity in the house. The spirits of S.K. Pierce and his wife, Susan, as well as their son Edward have been seen here, often joined by their nanny, Maddie Cornwell. Others have claimed that the figure of a man named David, who was said to have ended the life of a street worker in the house, is also seen here, along with his victim. Others have reported seeing Pierce's granddaughter, Anosari's spirit, and others have seen the figure of a young boy, as well as dark entities that reside in the house's basement. Other experiences include the sounds of disembodied chanting, full-body apparitions, furniture moving on its own, window screens flying off without cause, door slamming, footsteps on the stairs, sudden temperature changes, foul odors, and the sight of shadow people. There have also been reports of an ominous lion's roar that seems to shake the entire house. One woman described a presence that tried to push her down the stairs, and another told of an entity that nearly forced her out of a third-story window. Many paranormal investigators have described the spirits in the house as the most advanced they have ever seen, and they have the skill to harness electrical energy that is converted into the ability to move objects around at will. A true story recounted by a woman only known as Jane concerns a haunted house located at 455A Sackett Street in Brooklyn, New York. Her family moved into the house in 1998, and she felt right from the start that something was out of place in the building. She describes it as an incredibly dark space, though they should have been excited to move in as they had never lived in a multi-story apartment before this one having three floors, including the basement. But about two weeks after moving in, strange events started to occur. A neighbor told the family that no one had lived in the property for more than a year at the time, as they were forced to move due to tragedies that would befall them and the strange atmosphere in the building. Jane recalls that there was indeed a strange ambience in the apartment, and that it was cold, damp, and uninviting. They decorated the place to make it feel more homely, but try as they might, nothing seemed to help. Shortly after, the ceiling in her brother's bedroom collapsed right after he left the room to use the bathroom. On another occasion, a neighbor ran over to the house, screaming that one of the bedrooms was on fire. While Jane ran upstairs, she saw that her bedroom was engulfed in flames, and she attempted to put it out with a blanket, but the door slammed shut behind her and she had to be rescued by a friend after nearly passing out from smoke inhalation. Another friend left the house screaming after seeing the spirit of a boy dressed in rags staring directly at her from the bathroom mirror. Another friend, who had not been told of these experiences, reported seeing a woman walk into Jane's room through a closed door. One day, Jane and her brother heard the sound of children crying and laughing, and when they tried to leave their mother's room, they found themselves locked in, even though there was no lock on the door. It took nearly an hour before the door inexplicably opened again. Jane further explains that to the day that they moved out, they always felt as though someone or something wanted them to leave and never come back. The story of Tatsuko Horikawa is probably the most famous on this list. It spawned copycats looking for internet fame and independent movies, but the original story was terrifying on its own. It began with an unknown Japanese man in his 50s. He lived alone in the city of Kasuya. Kasuya isn't a major city, and while growing in terms of the number of residents, it doesn't have the same homelessness problems seen elsewhere in the country. Homelessness was the last thing on this anonymous man's mind when he went about his life in 2008. More pressing to him was the fact that his food seemed to be going missing from his fridge. It wasn't a large amount. It went unnoticed at first. When he eventually did notice, 
the man assumed he had been sleepwalking. This wasn't something he had ever done before, and there were no major events going on in his life that could have caused sleepwalking due to stress. But as he lived alone, it was the only explanation he had. The man tried to put the disappearances to the back of his mind, but food continued to go missing. He would also find things that had been moved around ever so slightly. He began to think a thief may be responsible. No valuables were ever stolen, even things that weren't locked away. Only food was ever taken. It was strange, but after the man ruled out sleepwalking, there was really no other explanation. The man went to great lengths to secure his home, but it seemed to not deter the thief. There was also no sign of forced entry. At this point, he began to fear he was going insane. Desperate to prove this was really happening, the man bought a number of cameras which he would connect to his phone. An app would alert him if the cameras detected any movement. Finally, he found some creepy proof of a person that really was taking his food. The camera showed a woman taking a meal from the man's fridge. She then sat on his sofa to watch TV and eat the food. When she was done, she cleaned up, making sure to leave no trace of herself, and disappeared off camera. The footage was of too poor of a quality to make out her face, but that didn't matter. He knew she shouldn't have been in his home. The man contacted police, who went to the house and found it completely secure. Once inside, they conducted a thorough search of the house. In a closet in a rarely used room, police found Tatsuko Horikawa curled up on a thin futon on the top shelf. She was 58 years old and homeless. Tatsuko told police she'd gotten into the house about a year earlier when the man forgot to lock his front door. She'd been living there ever since, eating his food and using the bathroom when he was at work. She was described as perfectly neat and clean. Because she hadn't stolen any valuables, she was only charged with trespassing and made to leave her tiny home. Even though the scary true story made its way into newspapers around the world, little is known about this case beyond what was originally reported. The incident took place in Arlington, Virginia in 2017. The town had been taking drastic steps to decrease homelessness. But there were still hundreds of people with no other option than living on the streets. One of these people was Anthony Jones, a 60-year-old African-American man. Sometime in the early summer of 2017, he found a sliding glass door to a house on 22nd Street South unlocked. Without being seen or heard by the occupant or her neighbors, Anthony slipped inside and got settled into the attic. It's not clear if Anthony knew it at the time, but the house was only occupied by a single elderly woman. The woman living in the house asked to not be named in the press and remains anonymous. It was the early hours of the morning of July 25th when the woman heard strange noises coming from above her. Usually, it would be easy to dismiss this as the house settling or maybe even an animal that had gotten inside. But to the woman, it sounded far too much like the shuffling of footsteps to ignore. The woman called her landlord, expecting to hear his ringtone coming from the attic. Sometimes, he would use the attic as a storage space. Like something from a horror film, her landlord told her it wasn't him. He called the police, who arrived at 1.30 a.m. They entered the house from a staircase at the back and called for anyone who was there to come out. Anthony surrendered and was taken into police custody. Police found his backpack, clothing, and bedding in the corner, but it was impossible to tell how long he'd actually been there. It was February of 2019 when college student Maddie came home from her lunch break to hear her closet doors rattling. This was just the latest in a string of strange occurrences that she was beginning to attribute to ghosts. Maddie was a junior at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro in an apartment complex that housed only students. In the weeks leading up to the incident, 
she'd noticed items of clothing disappearing and her belongings moving about. Her flatmate had no explanation for what was happening and they both started to fear something supernatural might be going on, though it only seemed to target Maddie. When she heard the rattling coming from her closet though, Maddie knew she needed answers. She held the door shut, then asked who was in there. To her surprise, the person that called back said his name was Drew. Drew's real name, as it would turn out, was Andrew Swafford. Maddie asked if he wanted to hurt her. Swafford, of course, said no. Maddie didn't trust him, but could feel the man trying to force the door open. She knew she couldn't keep it closed, so let Swafford out while she told her boyfriend what was happening. Swafford was dressed in Maddie's clothes, including her socks and shoes. While they waited for Maddie's boyfriend to arrive, he went into the bathroom to look at himself in the mirror. He told Maddie she was pretty and asked to hug her. Maddie refused and later said Swafford didn't touch her. She kept him talking until help arrived. She didn't call police, scared of what he would do, if she did what he asked her not to. She did try to make an emergency call on her Apple Watch, but it didn't work. When Maddie's boyfriend arrived, Swafford fled. Police found him just a few blocks away where he was arrested. Swafford already had a criminal record, mostly for drug-related offenses, and failing to appear in court. He was charged with breaking and entering identity theft, and possession of stolen goods. It's not clear how long Swafford was in the apartment or how he got in. It seems unlikely he'd been in the closet the entire time Maddie had noticed clothes going missing. Instead, he probably came from a more secret hiding spot, thinking the students wouldn't be home, and went to the easily accessed closet to wait for Maddie to leave when she arrived unexpected. A group of students from Ohio State University were left with one more housemate than they were expecting when they moved into an off-campus house in Columbus. The incidents started like a stereotypical haunting. It started as soon as they moved in. Lights would be left on or off, doors left open, and items in the communal areas would be moved apparently without anybody taking responsibility. As there were a large number of people living in the house, five on each of the three floors, most assumed one of their housemates were responsible and didn't think much of it. The basement was a different matter though. As far as any of them knew, the only thing that was in the basement was a maintenance area. There was a locked door down there, but they assumed it was either storage for the landlord or some other maintenance room. The only time any of them needed to go down there was when the power would randomly stop working on the second floor. This happened more often than they thought should be normal, requiring someone to go down to the basement and flip the circuit breaker. The students complained about the apparently dodgy electronics to the landlord, but nothing was done. While in the basement one day, one of the students, a boy named Brad, heard noises coming from the locked room. He guessed one of his housemates was in the room and tried to open the door, but found it locked. Brett was also the first person to meet the mysterious 16th housemate, though he wouldn't know it at the time. The house was split between two groups of friends, 10 on the top two floors and 5 on the bottom floor. The two groups didn't know one another well. It would just be a nod as they crossed in the hall as they went in or out of the building. So when Brett saw a man he didn't recognize as he came into the house, he assumed it was one of the residents living on the ground floor. The man called himself Jeremy and seemed to be in a rush to leave. Eventually, the students started to put pieces together. Either the house was haunted or there was someone unaccounted for who was responsible for the strange occurrences. They did a thorough search of the house, then called the landlord about the basement. The landlord had to force his way into the basement where he was surprised to find a fully furnished bedroom complete with student textbooks and framed photographs. The person who lived there wasn't in at the time, but it was clear to see he was coming in and out of a side entrance. 
The group left a note asking the 16th housemate to call them. Jeremy did and came back to the house to collect his things and move out. It would turn out Jeremy had lived in the house before the new tenants. The landlord didn't change the locks between tenants and the keys had no marking warning not to duplicate them. Jeremy had simply kept a copy of his key and had been living rent-free since the start of the new school year. After Jeremy moved out, the odd occurrences stopped happening and the students completed their studies without any other troubles. Most stories about people living in strangers' homes without their knowledge are about people looking for a place to stay or some strange stalker. But there's a good reason why people are fearful things could be worse. In 1941, Theodore Conies entered the home of a former acquaintance and lived there for almost a year. His illegal residency wouldn't be completely unnoticed though, and Theodore took the life of his acquaintance to keep his secret. It started out like most other entries on this list. At 59 years old, Conies had spent most of his adult life homeless, mostly due to health conditions that led doctors to believe he wouldn't make it to his 18th birthday. In September of 1941, he had gone to visit Philip Peters. Philip was a well-liked and respected member of the community. He was married to a woman named Helen and they had five children together, though they'd all grown up and moved out by the time the incident occurred. Philip was a retired railroad employee and a musician, and he'd met Coney's at the guitar club where he gave lessons. At the end of the summer, Helen Peters had broken her hip and needed a lengthy stay in the hospital. Not wanting Philip to be alone, his neighbors would often invite them to their homes in the evening. It was while Philip was out that Coney's had come to visit. Finding the house empty, Coney snuck inside. He'd planned to simply steal food and money, but came across something more valuable. A small trap door that led to a crawl space where he decided to make himself at home. Coney's lived in the crawl space for a few weeks, coming out when Philip was out of the house to raid his icebox. On October 17th, Philip came home one evening before Coney's had time to hide and found the intruder in his kitchen. Philip struck him with his cane, but Coney's fought back, taking Philip's life. Rather than running though, Coney's returned to the crawl space where he had been living. Neighbors eventually discovered Philip's remains when he didn't show up for dinner. Police found no sign of forced entry and couldn't explain the crime. They did find the trap door that Coney's was hiding behind, but assumed it was too small for anyone to get through. Helen Peters returned to her home not long after her husband lost her life. She hired a housekeeper to help her look after the building. Both women reported hearing strange noises. It's not surprising, given the violent incident had occurred not long ago, that they both thought the house was haunted. The housekeeper quit and Helen eventually moved in with one of her children. Coney's continued to live in the house, having driven its legal residence away. Children in the neighborhood would notice lights turning on and off in the house, and rumors that it was haunted spread. Police would often come to check on the house as they thought pranksters had broken in. In July of 1942, they were making one such check when they heard someone upstairs. Going upstairs, they found Coney's. He confessed to everything and was sentenced to life in prison for his crimes. This seemingly normal looking photo was taken a few weeks before Christmas in 1929. Charlie Lawson drove his family from the small farming community of Germantown, North Carolina to the nearby metropolis of Winston-Salem. Charlie had bought himself, his wife, Fanny and their seven children new outfits which he instructed them to wear on the drive to a photography studio. In the professional family portrait photo, Charlie and Fanny are pictured in the back right, with Fanny holding baby Mary Lou. Clustered around them, all with serious expressions on their faces, are their six children, ages 2 to 17. The photo has a dark and disturbing backstory. For just a few weeks later, all but one of the Lawson family members in the picture would be gone. On Christmas morning, 1929, 
the oldest daughter, 17-year-old Marie, woke up early to prepare special cakes. Charlie and his oldest son, 16-year-old Arthur, went on a morning hunting expedition. After a short time, Charlie sent his son to town to buy more hunting supplies. Then Charlie returned to the farm. As he walked back to his home, Charlie happened upon his two daughters, 12-year-old Carrie and 7-year-old Maybell, heading to visit their aunt and uncle. They would never make it. As the real horror story goes, Charlie took the lives of his daughters, first with his hunting equipment, then with the handle of a farming hoe. Charlie went home and did the same to his wife as she sat upon the porch. In the kitchen, he took down Marie, age 17, as she cooked, and then his youngest sons, James, age 2, and Raymond, age 4. Even the four-month-old baby, Mary Lou, was not spared. As his last act, Charlie ran into the woods and ended the night of horror with his own life. Next to him, crime scene investigators found letters written to his parents and a note that simply read, blame nobody but I. There are different stories of what happened next. In one version, their teenage son Arthur returned home and saw the bodies of his family. Others say it was relatives visiting for the holiday. The Lawson family was buried in a single plot, at the funeral that drew more than 1,500 mourners from across the state. To this day, no one knows the true story behind this terrible crime. There have been some unsubstantiated rumors that his oldest daughter, Marie, was pregnant with his child. Today, all that remains of Charlie and his family is the unnerving image taken just weeks before the dark and disturbing backstory in which he turned on his wife and children. In this weird photo, billionaire financier J.P. Morgan is pictured sitting in a chair in the Senate caucus room. On June 1, 1933, Morgan had been summoned to testify before a congressional committee in regards to suspicious banking practices. One reporter was determined to cover this story however he could. He remembered seeing an unusual pair in the hallway, a circus performer by the name of Lia Graff and her press agent and hatched a plan. Lia's agent, seeing the opportunity for notoriety, waited until J.P. Morgan sat down and placed Lia upon his lap. The two were caught on camera chatting politely. Morgan remarked that he had a grandchild bigger than Lia, to which she replied that she was surely older than his grandchild. The photos, which made front pages across the country, were hailed as showing that the greatest banker was only human. This was a major win for J.P. Morgan, who was suffering from bad press as a result of the hearing into his shady dealings. Lia's backstory is far more disturbing, though. 27-inch tall Lia, a young German immigrant in the 1930s, was by all reports shy and sensitive. It's likely that due to her short stature, working with the circus was the only career that was open to her. Lia could tolerate the work as a circus performer, but she did not appreciate the fame that came with her front page photo. Two years after meeting J.P. Morgan, she was so overwhelmed from the publicity that she returned to her home country. Lia Graf was a stage name. Her real name was Lia Schwartz. She was half Jewish. In 1937, four years after she was America's sweetheart, she was arrested in Germany. In 1941, her tragic true story ends with Auschwitz, where she most likely did not survive. In this black and white vintage photo, a man stands among a lush field of corn. Many stalks are taller than him, and hidden in the background, viewers can see more plants and what looks like a tropical forest. The caption on the photo reads, quote, Publicity photo of Jim Jones standing in corn growing in Jonestown. Despite the fact that it happened nearly 50 years ago, Americans still know Jones's name and what happened at his doomed commune. The Jonestown Massacre residents remain one of the scariest stories in American history. Yet in this creepy promotional photo, taken sometime between 1976 and 1978, Jones was attempting to market a utopia. Despite the idyllic appearance on the surface, Jones's group was no longer a utopian movement. It was a frightening cult. 
In the mid-1950s, Jim Jones opened his first church in Indianapolis. By 1970, Jones and his People's Temple had amassed thousands of followers who were drawn to him due to his message of peace and humanitarianism, as well as his reported displays of mind reading and faith healing. The People's Temple was also racially integrated, which was noteworthy for the time period. Members of the church felt that they were part of a family rather than a congregation. Despite the humanism that Jones preached, members of his church were treated quite poorly and subjected to real-life horror stories of prolonged isolation and even having large snakes wrapped around their necks. In the 1970s, Jones and hundreds of members of his congregation decided to move to the small nation of Guyana, where he promised he would build Jonestown a socialist utopia in the jungle. Life in Jonestown involved long days in the fields in order to sustain their community. Residents had their passports confiscated and their letters home were censored. An increasingly paranoid Jones encouraged them to inform upon one another and required everyone to attend lengthy late night meetings where they participated in faith-based ceremonies. This included drinking substances that they were told would end their lives but never did. It was just a test. In 1978, a U.S. congressman named Leo Ryan traveled to Jonestown to investigate various allegations. Several of the People's Temple members asked Congressman Ryan to help them escape. Fearing for the sanctity of this settlement, Jones ordered the congressman and his companions to be done away with. After this, Jim Jones commanded all of Jonestown's residents to gather in the main pavilion to commit a revolutionary act. The citizens, some of them believing this was another faith-based drill, lined up to drink a poison-laced fruit juice concoction. The following day, when Guyanese authorities arrived at the compound, they found bodies. Some of them had their arms wrapped around each other. Fewer than 100 residents of Jonestown had survived and those that did escape had hidden in the jungle. The socialist utopia Jim Jones had been so eager to portray in his creepy photos had completely failed, taking hundreds of innocent lives with it. This unsettling photo of Harold Anew, a top American physicist, doesn't look creepy. Wearing a short sleeve shirt and shorts, he grins into the camera. In his right hand, he holds a small box it could almost be a photo of a man and his lunch. Unless, of course, you know the disturbing backstory behind this image. The box Harold is holding is the plutonium core of the Nagasaki Fat Man atomic bomb. Just a few months after the photo was taken, the core would be the direct end of the lives of more than 70,000 people. Harold was one of many scientists working on the Manhattan Project at the Los Alamos National Laboratory during World War II. With the Fat Man, a dense plutonium core was placed at the center that, when ignited, released a shock wave that the war had never seen. It is this core weighing about 14 pounds that Harold is holding in the photo. A single gram of the matter inside the core would be converted into a force equivalent to 21,000 tons of TNT. The decision to use this device remains one of history's greatest horror stories. However, some U.S. military advisors and some scientists, like Dr. Anu, believed it was necessary to end the war. In 1992, he remarked, quote, We did pretty good. We brought a quick end to a devastating war and maintained the peace and eventually saw democracy prevail. That's something you can hang your hat on. Harold Anu witnessed the dropping of the first atomic bomb on Japan, the little boy, on August 6, 1945. He took notes on the size of the shockwave and caught it on a home camera. Afterwards, he had a distinguished scientific career in nuclear technology. He would pass away in 2013 at the age of 92. Point guard Mark Jackson spent his early days as a professional basketball player for the New York Knicks. It wasn't a remarkable year by most metrics, although Jackson, along with Patrick Ewing and Charles Oakley, would transform the Knicks into a major playoff contender in the following years, the 1990 season was just okay. But Jackson's 1990 NBA Hoops basketball card 
has become something of a commodity in recent years, with professionally graded versions selling for more than $450. The hair-raising reason behind the photo's value remains hidden in the background of the card. If you look past Jackson, on the left-hand side of the image, there are two similar-looking men sitting courtside. Those aren't just any spectators. They've been confirmed to be the famous Mendez brothers, Lyle and Eric. In 1989, the two young men took the lives of their wealthy parents as they watched TV in their Beverly Hills mansion. In their 1996 trial, during which they were found guilty, prosecutors theorized that the brothers had been too impatient to wait for their inheritance which was to be $14 million in the event that both their mother and father passed together. Lyle and Eric's disturbingly unusual behavior after the crime truly seemed to support this conclusion. Rather than seeming remorseful, the brothers went on lavish spending sprees. Between August of 1989 and when they were apprehended in 1990, they spent about $700,000 on clothes, businesses, watches, and more. Among all the luxury items they bought, seemingly insignificant, was a line item for two courtside tickets to a New York Knicks game, leading to this creepy photograph. No one knew about the true horror story hidden in this photograph until August 12, 2018, when a Twitter user posted a photo of the card with the caption that jokingly read, quote, Mood, my Mark Jackson baseball card with cameos from the Menendez brothers in the background. An anonymous user reposted the picture in December of that year, and it quickly went viral, with users buying up the card and speculating whether or not the two scary people pictured were actually the infamous brothers. The timeline fit, and in January of 2019, the haunting photograph became a confirmed sighting. A news outlet managed to get a hold of Lyle Menendez in the San Diego prison, where he is currently incarcerated. He confirmed that the unnerving image pictured him and his brother hidden in the background. Who knows what other untold stories and creepy secrets might be lurking in photos across the world. Perhaps analog materials like this will continue to be used to solve mysteries. Carl Landers was an experienced mountaineer with ambitions of climbing to the top of the highest peak in every Californian county. He'd managed a few when he and two friends set out to climb Mount Shasta in May of 1999. It had snowed overnight, but that wasn't much of an issue. The mountain itself wasn't particularly a difficult climb, though its height could lead to altitude sickness. Usually, climbers set off from the 50-50 camp above the tree line in the early hours of the morning, but Carl and his friends had a later start time in mind. Carl was feeling unwell, but instead of delaying the climb, this prompted him to set off ahead of his friends. He left the camp at around 9 a.m. with plans of meeting his friends at Lake Helen. This is the last confirmed sighting of him. Around 30 minutes later, his friends began to follow him up the mountain. One turned back early on, leaving the second friend, a man named Milton, to catch up with Carl alone. When he reached the lake, Carl was nowhere to be seen. He asked a ranger if he'd seen anyone, and the ranger described speaking to an older man that matched Carl's description. The man was visible on the trail ahead, and Milton began to follow him, thinking it was his friend. However, after a short time following the hiker, Milton realized he was going too fast to be Carl, and he didn't think his clothing matched. Milton turned back and returned to the camp, thinking Carl must have turned back as well. When he realized Carl wasn't at the 50-50 camp, he and the second friend alerted authorities. Despite many searches of the mountain at the time and in the years since, Carl has never been found. It's likely he was suffering with dehydration, which combined with the altitude could have led to him getting disoriented and lost, later dying from exposure. However, if that is the case, how has his body never been found? It remains a mystery. George Pinka Jr. had been on a hike with a group from his church when he went missing from the top of Upper Yosemite Falls in 2011. The 30-year-old was in a group of around 20 people hiking up to the top of Yosemite Falls on June 17. The weather was pleasant and the trail itself is relatively well-maintained and not difficult to hike. However, it's fairly steep and long and connects with other hiking trails. The group reached the top of the falls at around 2.40 p.m. Once at the top, they dispersed and planned to regroup to hike back to Yosemite Valley. 
It's not clear how long they were at the top of the falls, or where any of the hikers went during that time, but when they regrouped, George was not with them. They assumed George must have begun walking back down the trail alone, and it doesn't appear as if there was any significant search at the time. It wasn't until the group made it back to the valley that evening that they realized George wasn't back at the base and reported him missing. Around a dozen helicopters and more than 100 search and rescue workers searched the falls and surrounding trails over the following days. Around 70 square miles of rugged terrain was covered in the extensive search, but there was no sign of the missing hiker. After around a week, the search was scaled back due to a lack of clues about his whereabouts. Part of the issue may have been the confusion about when exactly George went missing. Officially, he was last seen when the group reached the top of the falls, and it was assumed he wandered off at some point while the group was dispersed. However, it's possible George didn't make it to the top of the falls at all. Not long after he was reported missing, George's cousin claimed he hadn't been feeling well due to the trek to the falls, and turned back before. It was possible he took the wrong trail back and got lost in the park. If that's the case, it's possible the early search efforts were focused in the wrong place. Either way, there's been no sign of George since his disappearance, and his case has gone cold. The United States isn't the only country where national parks can become the last known locations for missing people. Countries all over the world face the problem of people disappearing in the wilderness, some to a greater extent than others. James Norman went missing in strange circumstances from West Cape Ho National Park in Australia in 2015. The 33-year-old and his friend had gone out to fish on Dunsky Beach on February 18. They both knew the area fairly well and James was confident in the water, so when he decided to go for a swim, after drinking a cask of wine, neither were too worried. James swam to nearby Shelley Beach. His friend watched him reach the shore and walk along the beach and onto a rocky outcrop. After that, he disappeared from sight and hasn't been seen since. His friend reported him missing when he couldn't find James, and an extensive land and sea search took place. Police didn't believe there was any criminality involved, but were concerned for his safety and urged anyone to get in touch if they had any information. There were a few reported sightings at a nearby campsite, but police were unable to confirm whether this was really the missing man. Most believe it's likely James got back into the water, possibly in an attempt to swim back to his friend. Though a strong swimmer, the sea can be dangerous no matter how experienced someone is, so it's possible he was swept away from the beach. However, if this were the case, it seems unlikely that none of his remains would have come ashore. The area is known for shark sightings, particularly great whites. Though shark attacks are fairly rare, it's possible James was attacked, although again, there would likely be some kind of evidence for this. Some local to the area have a darker theory. It would have been difficult for the friend to have seen James on Shelly Beach without binoculars and some suspect the mile-long swim in shark-infested waters would be unrealistic. The theory implies James never made it to shore in the first place and something happened to him either on his swim to Shelly Beach or while he was still with his friend. Christina Kaleka was not an experienced hiker or camper, but had decided to go with the small group of friends to the Rainbow Falls provincial park to enjoy a long weekend off work. The group of four young adults arrived at the park in Ontario, Canada around noon after setting up camp and taking a nap, and stayed up until around 4 a.m. They made a bonfire, enjoyed food, and chatted. At the time, it didn't seem as if there was anything out of the ordinary on Christina's mind. Despite the late night, Christina and a friend, Eddie, woke up at 6.30 a.m. Eddie was a friend from church and somebody Christina knew relatively well. Both wanted to go running, but Christina wanted to run along the park trails, while Eddie preferred the nearby highway. Instead of compromising, the pair split up. Eddie returned to camp an hour later, but Christina didn't come back. The group, which included Christina's cousin, reported her missing a few hours later. Since 2009, there have been multiple searches organized by both Ontario police and Christina's family. Hundreds of search and rescue workers searched the park and the nearby Lake Superior for any signs of her, with planes and even a submarine used at one point, but each search turned up nothing. There are two main theories as to what happened to Christina. The first and most obvious is that she got lost while wandering off the trail and possibly injured herself, or was attacked by one of the wild animals that calls the park its home. 
It seems unlikely that no one would have found any evidence of this in the many searches that took place, but it is possible and cadaver dogs did indicate that they found human remains in the river at one point, though the water was too dangerous to search properly. The other darker theory is that Christina met with foul play. Christina's family did not believe anyone she went camping with would hurt her, and there's evidence she was at the campsite that day before she disappeared. Police repeatedly interviewed the three friends Christina was camping with, but nothing came from them. It's possible she may have run into someone else while jogging in the park, and was taken out by an opportunistic attacker. Millions of people visit Yellowstone National Park every year. The park covers almost 3,500 square miles, most of which is wilderness, and is known for its wildlife and geothermal features. More recently, it's become known as a hotspot for disappearances, but this isn't entirely accurate. The vast majority of people who go missing in the park are found relatively quickly, and most self-rescue, getting back on track without needing help from a search party. Sadly, 47-year-old Dan Campbell and his Australian Shepherd dog, Freckles, are in the minority of people who go missing in the park and are never recovered. Dan went missing in April of 1991. He and his brothers had been saving up for a move from their home in Idaho to White Sulphur Springs. As part of that, Dan had been getting involved with what his brothers described as shady characters and engaging in illegal activity. On April 4, 1991, Dan and Freckles were dropped off at the trailhead for Hellroaring Creek. He was allegedly planning to hike through to Jardine, Montana to pick up some elk antlers he'd collected and saved for later. Collecting elk antlers in the park was not legal, but would bring in thousands of dollars. Dan was reported missing four days later when he didn't arrive in Jardine. In the meantime, there had been severe snowfall, and even though Dan was an experienced outdoorsman, there was no worry that he may have been injured in the snow. An extensive air and land search began the following day, though snowstorms and avalanche warnings hindered operations. There was no sign of Dan or his dog, and his family and authorities began to believe something more sinister had occurred. Collecting antlers seemed like one of the most nonviolent activities that could take place in a national park. The animals themselves naturally shed their horns, so there's little need for them to be killed in order for hunters to profit. However, the large sums of money involved has attracted people willing to protect their territory with semi-automatic weaponry. They fear another hunter may have considered that Dan was trespassing on his territory and killed him to protect their trade, or that one of the other shady characters he was involved with committed the murder. Authorities have also suggested it's possible Dan may have willingly disappeared to start fresh somewhere new, though his family doesn't believe this is possible. Dan would be in his 70s now, and if he didn't willingly disappear, it's highly likely he passed away decades ago, though neither him nor his dog's remains have ever been found. In the 1980s, Australian doctor Dr. Barry Marshall took on a medical mystery that had been baffling the medical community for nearly 100 years. He rose to the challenge of finding the true cause of stomach ulcers. You see, for decades it was believed that stress was the reason that people got stomach ulcers, but Dr. Marshall wasn't convinced. He told the podcast, Science Solved It. It was such a tradition of believing that stress causes ulcers, really going back for nearly 100 years, that nobody questioned it anymore. Nobody could really tell me where this evidence had come from, and in fact, there were a few experiments on different things which were never repeated and probably could never be repeated because they were just a one-off. But they're written up in such a way that it fitted with everyone's concept, so it went on. Dr. Marshall was alerted by a colleague to a strange occurrence he had discovered in patients with stomach ulcers. This was back in 1981 when Dr. Marshall was in his third year of fellowship at the Royal Perth Hospital. The colleague that told him of these findings was chief pathologist Dr. Robin Warren. Dr. Warren had noticed that patients who were referred to him for ulcers had a bacteria called H. pylori living in their gut. Determined to get to the bottom of this, Dr. Marshall began cultivating the bacteria and testing it on mice and pig models. These experiments had little to no success, but Dr. Marshall was determined to continue. So in a last ditch effort to prove his theory right, he swallowed some of the bacteria. He says, I brewed up the bacteria in petri dishes and put it into roast beef soup and then drank the bacteria. Within five days, Dr. Marshall was violently ill. He was vomiting and ordered an endoscopy for himself. Sure enough, the endoscopy showed a bacterial infection and an inflamed stomach, the precursor to stomach ulcers. 
Thanks to Dr. Marshall's persistence in the name of science and medicine, we now understand stomach ulcers a little bit better, and doctors were able to prescribe a course of antibiotics to kill the infection. Dr. Marshall and Dr. Warren won a Nobel Prize in the medicine discipline in 2005 for their work which improved and saved the lives of countless patients. The Blood Falls of Antarctica have been mystifying scientists since its discovery in 1911. In 1911, a group of explorers and scientists came across a phenomenon that concluded that the blood-red color of the water was caused by algae. Many, many years later, scientists would not only debunk this, but also reveal the source of the falls. Located in McMurdo's Dry Valleys, the Blood Falls look like something straight out of a horror film. In fact, it would make a perfect location to shoot a film about being trapped under the icy tundra. Years later, scientists discovered that the blood-red color was caused by iron-rich brine reacting with the air creating the blood-red color. The mystery of the falls wasn't over though. Scientists still had to figure out where the source of the falls was. In 2017, two scientists named Aaron and Christina and a team of other scientists from the University of Alaska set out to find the truth about Antarctica's blood falls. They said, we did not know where the brine came from. We didn't know how it made it through the glacier. If the brine started at the base of the glacier, it should have continued to flow at the base. Utilizing radio wave technology, Erin and her team trekked across the Taylor Glacier to unearth the secrets that laid below, and it was a success. The radio waves sent out pulses into the ice which flow freely, however when they hit the brine they scatter out, allowing Erin and her team to map out where the source of the blood falls was. Once mapped out, the team managed to pinpoint the root of the brine water as it ran through the glacier. They also discovered that pressure caused the brine water, hidden in a one million year old lake, below to seep out to the top, thus creating the blood falls. Aaron told Vice in 2018, It was a pretty powerful pressurized brine in that conduit even though it's not always squirting out of the top of the glacier, it's always sitting within the ice as a pressurized slushy mess. On June 30th, 1908, the residents of a small town in Siberia were rocked by a huge explosion that seemingly came from the sky near a local river. Locals in the area reported seeing a huge fireball coming from the sky, emanating a bright blue light before crashing near the river, accompanied by sounds of artillery fire. People were panicked and in shock. Were they being attacked by an enemy force by bombs? Was this a UFO that had crashed in the middle of nowhere? Not only did the event bring a huge fireball and bright lights, but windows in nearby villages shattered and people were also swept off their feet by the sheer force. One witness said the sky was split in two, and high above the forest, the whole northern part of the sky appeared to be covered with fire. At that moment, there was a bang in the sky and an almighty crash. The crash was followed by a noise like stones falling in the sky or guns firing. According to Russian historical records, there were no human casualties, but that seems unlikely given the scale and force of the blast. The Tunguska blast was the most powerful explosion in history and produced 185 times more energy than the atomic bomb that hit Hiroshima. Without an impact crater, scientists and locals were left stunned. Many in the surrounding areas took this as a sign from the Siberian god of thunder, and they believed that they'd done something to anger them, and in turn, he sent a blast that reduced reindeer to a mere carcass and flattened 80 million trees. It wasn't until over 100 years later in 2013 that a team of Ukrainian scientists discovered the truth. These scientists traveled to the Tunguska site and analyzed peat and found that it contained minerals found by meteorites. Wanting to confirm their findings, they contacted scientists in Arizona and compared their research to a meteor impact in Arizona. Elemental analysis was a match to those found in Arizona as well as Tunguska. It might have taken over 100 years, but finally, the mystery of the Tunguska blast was solved. The moving sailing stones in California's Dead Valley were some of the most elusive and weirdest mysteries scientists just couldn't get their head around. The large stones, weighing hundreds of pounds, seemingly moved on their own accord, leaving behind tracks in the cracked desert floor. Many were drawn to the explanation of aliens moving the stones to mess around with humans and leave them constantly wondering how and why. That was until 2013 when Richard and James Norris saw the rocks moving. 
They were out in Dead Valley when they saw a layer of ice break into large panes and then be pushed by winds which caused them to slide. Richard told the LA Times, we were sitting on a mountainside and admiring the view when a light wind kicked up the ice and started cracking. Suddenly the whole process unfolded before our eyes. Scientists have been studying the phenomenon of the sailing stones since 1948, but were unsuccessful until Richard and James made the discovery in 2013. This is partly because the conditions need to be perfect. There needs to be rain and the temperature needs to be below freezing for ice to form. It then needs to rapidly heat to allow the ice to melt and the wind to push the stones. Considering we're talking about Death Valley in California, this combination of weather extremes is rare and previous attempts to capture the stones moving have failed. It seems that James and Richard were very lucky on that November 2013 day when they saw the rocks move. Between July 16th and 17th, 1918, the Romanov family of Russia were brutally executed by the Bolshevik revolutionaries in Russia. Not content with just killing Tsar Nicholas II, they also killed Empress Alexandra and her five children. Since the brutal execution of the Romanovs, the last Tsars of Russia, many conspiracy theories have sprung up surrounding the fate of their second youngest child, Anastasia. Over 200 women have come forward claiming to be the child, with wild claims of how they survived the brutal slaughter of their family. One such woman came forward and called herself Anna Anderson and said that she'd been whisked away by mysterious men. She couldn't explain why her life had been spared and why she'd waited until 1926 to resurface in Europe with the claim. For years, it remained a mystery where the Romanovs had been buried, as the Bolsheviks had first tried to dispose of their bodies in an abandoned mine shaft. When they realized that this was not a good idea, they made an unmarked mass grave for some of the Romanovs, while two of the children were buried separately. As the two children were buried separately and no concrete analysis had been completed, rumors and conspiracies were rife around the world, especially as over 200 women had come forward. It wasn't until 2007 that the world would find out the truth when amateur archaeologists uncovered two sets of children's remains just 70 meters from the large mass grave. Using DNA technology, genealogists and scientists ran samples from the bones against the samples of Nicholas II that was taken from a blood-stained shirt in 1891. The DNA was a match, meaning the two missing children had been found, and all claims of Anastasia surviving had been false. As it would turn out, Anastasia died along with her family. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.